Coming in number 10, we have, it was tougher than Al Capone. Al Capone is one of the most famous gangsters of all time. He was bringing booze to all the people when there was no way of getting your hands on the goods. Think of there was a person who was the face of the illegal weed trade and everyone saw him as one of the biggest, baddest people on the planet. That is this dude. He got his way no matter what the situation and even in prison, he was known to be treated like a king. Well, that was when he was locked up in Atlanta. There he was seen as a tough guy, but on the rock, he was just another prisoner. While in Alcatraz, he was treated like everyone else and it didn't take him long to fall in place and become the prisoner that the state always wanted him to be. This might've been because the rock was so brutal of a stronghold that even the toughest men in history would be broken down by its walls, or it could have been the fact that he was teeming with syphilis. The dude had it so bad that it started to get in his brain apparently made him very docile. I guess it's pretty easy to make a bad man good when his brain is melting away in his skull and he barely knows where he is half the time. Next on the list, we have someone swam to shore. Yeah, it might be crazy to think that people could actually be pulling this off. It was a mile and a half, which isn't impossible to do for today's athletes, but you have to remember that the people who would be pulling this off would have been in prison back in the 40s and 50s. There weren't people who were able to get in a lot of time training their cardio. You didn't have a treadmill in your cell, but there was a man who pulled it off. It was John Paul Scott. He jumped into the freezing waters of the San Francisco Bay and started swimming, but he was caught. He made it to the shore, but the trip was so brutal on his body that he passed out right when he made it to the bridge. He was way too cold and tired to keep moving, and the cops just found him laying there. He was able to escape by greasing up his body and sliding through the bars on his window. It was a pretty clever plan if you ask me, but this is something he should have tried to pull off in the summertime so he wouldn't have gotten the hypothermic shock when he reached the shore. Next we have Roy Gardner, one of the best breakout artists when it comes to escaping prison. This guy claimed that there wasn't a prison on earth that could hold him and it turns out he was wrong. The guy broke out of two prisons back to back until the cops had enough of him. They decided they wanted to ship him off to The Rock. That's where he would spend the rest of his life. Maybe he was just too old and tired to try and slip away because there were people who managed to get off this island, but he wasn't one of them. Next we have, there are a ton of ghosts in there. When you make one of the most notorious prisons on the planet, there's going to be a little bit of bad blood from the people who are forced to live there. And when you have that many people in one place that are creating hatred towards the place, well, you better believe that there's gonna be some spirits that want to muck the place up. If you are to visit the prison now, there's said to be a bunch of ghosts walking through the halls that can get aggressive at times. People have been touched when no one else is around. People have been pushed into walls like someone ran up and shoved them. There were reports that people were hearing someone yell into their ear. Not to mention all the regular ghost stuff that goes down there, like loud noises coming out of empty rooms, the sound of someone crying coming from an empty cell, and the feeling of cold spots, and a janitor that was held up against a wall by a ghost of a former inmate. Next, we have the beast. It would make sense that some sort of creature was able to manifest itself inside the the walls of Alcatraz. I mean, there has been so much negative energy over there that a demon would probably get so much fuel it might have to take a nap because it would be too full and have the itis. I don't know if that's something that happens to supernatural beings, but if they can, I would assume that Alcatraz would be the place to give it to them. But it would seem that there is one creature who has claimed the rock and has been there ever since the prison was active. There have been reports of some sort of dark four-legged creature that will walk through the halls at night. It apparently has glowing red eyes and and it's terrifying to look at. The most horrific telling of this creature is that an inmate started screaming one night that there was some sort of monster in his cell with him. His screams echoed through the whole prison, but the guards never came to come help him because in Alcatraz, it's going to take a lot more than claims of a monster in your cell for the guards to care about you. Well, in the morning when they found him, he was dead. Maybe he was just having a stroke, and because of this, he was hallucinating before he died. I don't even know if that's something that could happen before you die from a stroke. I'm just spitballing over here here. Next on the list, we have the Curse of the Island. Alcatraz was built out on the rock in the middle of the ocean because they knew it would be hard for prisoners to get back to the mainland and they would be forced to live out there until they died. They would even tell prisoners that there were sharks in the water, so if they tried to swim back, they would get eaten, and if they got caught trying to escape, they would be given solitary confinement. But little did the people building the prison know was that the island was cursed way before the prison was built and all the stuff they said about sharks was actually lying. 
lies. The Native Americans who lived in the area talked about how there have been dark spirits on the island and the worst of their tribes would be outcasted to go live on that island. These dark beings were evil and it said that their spirits would never move on to the afterlife. If that's true, then the whole island must be a breeding ground for some of the biggest baddest spirits of all time. They have just been building up some negative energy and now it's all going to explode and take over the world. Or maybe, I don't know, maybe not. Next on the list we have Alcatraz was the ultimate correctional facility. Now you're probably thinking that if you were a terrible criminal, you got sent to the rock because you were now outcasted from society and people wanted you to rot out there. Well, you would be wrong. It was the worst prisoners that would get sent to the big prison floating in the middle of the ocean. You see, if you were acting up where you were already locked up, this could have been anything from starting a gang, to getting into fights, to bribing guards, to trying to run away. Then you would be shipped off to the place where they would get all that behavior to stop. That meant that the guards and the warden that were at Alcatraz were the hardest in the country. You would be brought there because you would be forced into line and any of your antics would be thrown out the window. Alcatraz was known for creating model prisoners who would be broken down by the system. But with all that being said, we roll into some of the most rebellious prisoners with our next point. Next, we have the Battle of Alcatraz. So it would seem that the pressure of Alcatraz didn't turn everyone into a model prisoner. Some of the people used the time of being on hardcore lockdown to become even better criminals. In 1946, there was the Battle of Alcatraz, which was a two-day standoff and one of the wildest things that has ever happened in prison history. It all starts with Bernard Paul Coy. This dude was not about to be just chilling in Alcatraz. He had all the people in the prison convinced that he was the model citizen, that he wouldn't cause any trouble, but he was scheming the whole time. He was watching the guards, figuring out their comings and goings. He was mapping everything out. Then he broke down a plan to few of the people in the prison. The plan was to jump one of the guards, get some guns, and then escape. They launched their plan, and it didn't really go all the way through, and it didn't go as planned at all. Turns out they didn't have the keys to get out of the prison after they jumped the guard. They only had keys to get guns, and now they ended up in a standoff with the Coast Guard. It was a two-day bloodbath, and all the men involved in the battle and attempted escape ended up getting killed. Next on the list, guys, we have Machine Gun Kelly. I didn't know that the rapper got his name from a dude who was actually one of the most notorious criminals in American history. George Kelly, also known as Machine Gun Kelly, was one of the best bootleggers of his era. He not only was running around making money off of all the booze he was selling, but he was also very loud about it. I mean, once you have a nickname, that's when you start to take things a little too far. You don't want to become a criminal with a nickname unless it's because they don't know your actual name. You gotta keep a low profile, my dude. Well, this dude would reach new levels of fame when he would pull off a kidnapping. One of the biggest oil men in America would be in the clutches of Kelly, and he wanted big bucks for his safe return. Unfortunately for Kelly, he wouldn't get his wish, and he would end up locked up at the rock. He made claims that he would break out by Christmas, but he never got out. Next on the list, we have the original prisoners. Before The Rock was famous for being the hardest prison to break out of in America, it was a place where old Civil War POWs were taken. And back then, they were given even worse conditions than the prisoners who were forced to live there in the 1940s. They basically had nothing to keep them alive. They would have a little bit of food to fight over, and that's it. No water, no bathrooms, no showers, no heat, and a bunch of them would be forced into one cell. Plenty of them died in that prison because of the horrible conditions, and it's rumored that it would take days for them to come to remove the dead bodies from the cells. Starting off this countdown, we have the rotting flesh. Yes, this point is going to be as gross as it sounds. So this was posted by former prison guard and Reddit user Vman4402. One day he had to escort a new prisoner to medical, but he had no idea why. The prisoner just had two bandages on his legs and he couldn't bend his legs at all. When he was in front of the nurse and she removed the bandages, the guard finally figured out why. The guy's flesh was so swollen and it was just oozing pus. He was in so much shock that another guard had to come in and take his spot. He literally went into shock and lost all color in his skin. Now, this guard has seen some dark stuff, like people bleeding out in front of him. But to him, this was the worst thing he has ever seen. Moving on to number nine, we have the shampoo. And if you guys are liking this video so far, make sure to give it a big thumbs up because I appreciate it and it really helps us out. This story was shared by someone whose old roommate worked in the county jail. His roommate came home one day and looked visibly distressed. 
so he proceeded to find out what was wrong. Apparently at work, an inmate ate his shampoo because he couldn't shower. You thought that was bad? Guess what? The shampoo didn't agree with him, so he ended up tossing up all over himself uncontrollably. After that moment, the roommate decided that working at a prison was not for him. In our 8th spot, we have the pen. So this story comes from a guy whose dad was a prison guard. According to his dad, one day two prisoners teamed up and tried to attack a third prisoner. They had made their own weapon to stab the dude with, but it ended up breaking inside of him. So they decided to grab a pen and put it in his ear and then stomp on it. But the dude ended up living. Believe it or not, but when they stomped on the pen, it came out his mouth and he lived. Still, that's a pretty scary thing to witness. And now that I'm reading it back, I'm like, how is that possible? I know it's all connected, but I'm trying to figure it out like, I don't know. Moving on at number seven, we have the pirate. So according to Reddit user Rooster Shield, their neighbor was a corrections officer at a prison in his city. One day they got a new inmate and he had to share a cell with a more violent inmate. On a second night there, the violent inmate unscrewed a screw from a bench. He then woke up the new inmate and said, I'ma make you a pirate. The officer heard screams and ran to the cell. That's when he saw the new inmate with the screw in his eye. In our sixth spot, we have the hostage situation. Reddit user Divester shared the time his uncle was in a hostage situation at the prison he worked in. So his uncle was a prison guard for 10 years. This situation haunted him forever. A couple of years ago, five inmates planned to break out. Part of this plan was to get a hostage, so they took the uncle as their hostage. They yelled at him and threatened to kill him. Thankfully, everything ended up all right. The inmates didn't make it out of the prison and the uncle was fine and not injured physically, but mentally it scarred him. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the hot liquid. This next inmate did something very cruel to get back at a dorm officer that he did not like. Basically, he heated up coffee and baby oil in a cup in the microwave for several minutes. Then he took the burning hot liquid and tossed it in the guy's face. It actually burnt his face badly and he lost an eye because of it. Like that is very traumatic and sad. Moving on at number four, we have the hospital. This story was shared by a guy whose friend worked at a jail. He said that at his work, there was an inmate that was an old man that barely spoke English. One day he caught him banging his head on the wall in his cell until it started bleeding. When the guard stopped him, he demanded to be airlifted to a hospital in Atlanta. His injury wasn't that bad for them to do that, so they just treated the injury and then put him into a padded room so that he couldn't hurt himself. But I guess he just really wanted to be airlifted out of there. So while in the padded room, he started hurting himself again. This time, he took out his dentures and started scraping at his head wound with it so that it would bleed again. In fact, he picked at it so much that a three inch area of his skull was exposed. So they did need to airlift him out. So he got what he wanted in the end. Coming in at number three, we have the chickens. This story comes from Reddit user Midgeet. According to them, their friend's mom was a prison guard. One time she shared a story to him about a really weird encounter she had with an inmate. So she was on a night shift when she started hearing someone scream and cry for help. She ran to this guy's cell and caught him in the far corner of his cell pleading for help. The guard asked what was wrong and he said, the chickens, please get them out. He was adamant that there was a bunch of chickens in his cell. Obviously, there wasn't. So the prison guard had to open the door and pretend to usher these invisible chickens out. Clearly this dude was on drugs or something and he was just hallucinating. In our second spot, we have the bad injury. This story was posted by user Kleaborg. He used to work as a prison guard and saw some pretty dark things in his past. But one of the worst things he saw happened when an inmate slipped and fell in the bathroom. When this happened, his hip totally dislocated and came out of its socket and his leg was twisted at a horrific angle. Yeah, bones breaking and dislocating gross me out so much. 
That must have been incredibly painful, but also disgusting. And in a number one spot, we have The Haunting. Apparently, prisons are quite commonly haunted. And according to a woman named Gloria J. Arguello, a former prison guard, she witnessed a haunting. So she worked in a female unit. One day, an inmate told her that there was a man standing by her bed the night before. She described him as being a very tall and big dude. Gloria reassured her saying no one was there because there's no way men can get into the female section of the prison. That's when the inmate said the guy wasn't living, he was dead. Plot twist. The next day the inmate found Gloria and told her that the ghost had hurt her during the night. She said she woke up to the man grabbing her leg and squeezing it. She then proceeded to show Gloria her leg. And sure enough, there was a huge bruise handprint on her leg. There was no way the inmate could have done this to herself. So she was actually given a Bible and moved from her cell. Starting off this countdown, we have Nikolai Zumagaliev. This guy is so evil that it's hard to believe what he did was real. So Nikolai is a Soviet serial killer who took the lives of at least 10 people in the 1980s. He would target women and would often axe them to death, after in which he would eat them. In fact, he was given the name Metal Fang because he had false teeth made from white metal. That way, it was easier for him to be able to eat into the flesh. In the late 1980s, he was caught after having one of his friends over, and the friend found a human head and intestines inside of his fridge. After that, he was arrested and tried but declared insane. In 1989, when he was transported to another facility, Nikolai actually escaped and was on the run for two years. Thankfully, he was caught and re-institutionalized. But in December of 2016, he escaped again. But officials refused to confirm the claim. Either way, be careful around this guy, like he might try and escape for the third time. Moving on to number nine, we have Alan Leger. Alan Leger is a Canadian serial killer who on June 21st of 1986, entered a convenience store in Black River Bridge, New Brunswick with two other accomplices and robbed the joint. While doing so, they beat the store owner to death, but they were later caught and arrested. He was given a life sentence and sent to prison. However, in 1989, he managed to escape and was on the run for seven months. During this time, he killed four more innocent people. He also committed arson and a list of other crimes as well. Eventually, he was recaptured and is now spending the rest of his life in Canada's Maximum Security Special Handling Unit. Moving on to number eight, we have Rodney Halbauer. Ever since Rodney was young, he has been committing crimes. It started when he was only 16 years old. During his younger years, he was arrested and released on parole a number of times. But when released, he would commit more crimes, like theft. In 1975, Rodney was released on bail after taking advantage of a lost Vegas blackjack dealer. But while on bail, he took advantage of and killed six other women and received a life sentence. However, in 1977, he actually escaped jail and kidnapped his own daughter. Shortly after, he was recaptured only to escape again in 1986. While on the run, he stabbed and injured another woman. Thankfully, once again, he was recaptured. Wouldn't you think after the first time they would keep a closer eye on him? I guess not. In our seventh spot, we have Thomas Silverstein. Now this dude is said to be one of the most dangerous prisoners of all time and the most violent prisoner in America. He was first jailed in 1978 for armed robbery. While in jail, he killed a prison officer and two inmates. He also was the leader for the Aryan Brotherhood prison gang for quite some time. This prison gang is the largest and deadliest prison gang in the US with an estimated 20,000 members inside the prison and on the streets. Because of how many people he killed and injured in prison, Silverstein got transferred to a federal prison in Atlanta. There, he was confined in a six by seven foot cell. He was under 24 hour surveillance. In fact, the lights in his cell were never turned off so that they could always watch him. Silverstein eventually died in prison at the age of 67. In our sixth spot today, we have Victor Figueroa. On February 6th, 1997, Victor Figueroa managed to escape a Moroa shock incarceration facility in Mineville, New York. Victor had been serving a one to four year sentence for drug possession, but decided to take his chances and flee. When authorities noticed that he was missing, they searched the area, but all the leads ran cold. He has not been seen or heard from since. In fact, he's the only New York state prison inmate to escape and never be found. Either he's still out there or he died while trying to escape. Either way, it's a bit scary thinking that he could potentially still be out there. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with James Eddie Diggs. To the public, James Eddie Diggs seemed like a top-notch citizen. He seemed to be a great 
upbeat family man with a happy wife and two young sons. However, in the morning of May 26, 1949, he shot and killed his wife and kids before disappearing forever. Police did manage to find him a week later, but he managed to escape the officer by shooting him in the face and killing him. He since fled into the woods and hasn't been caught since. In fact, he was one of the FBI's 10 most wanted fugitives for the longest time, but he was eventually removed from the list in 1961 and is said to be dead by now. In our fourth spot, we have Robert Maudsley. Robert Maudsley is considered Britain's most dangerous prisoner, and you're about to find out why. In 1974, Maudsley was arrested for taking advantage of young individuals, but during his trial, he was found unfit and was sent to Broadmoor Hospital instead of a prison. While there, Maudsley and another patient locked themselves in a cell with another patient and held him hostage. While there, they tortured him to death over a period of nine hours. After this incident, he was convicted of manslaughter and was sent to Wakefield Prison. And there, he killed three inmates, after which he got placed in solitary confinement and spends his life in a glass cell underneath Wakefield Jail. In our third spot, we have George Edward Wright. In 1962, George Edward Wright was convicted for murder and was sentenced to up to 30 years in prison. Wright and three other men went on a spree of armed robbery, one in which they shot a man and took off with his money, which was only $70, so was it really worth it? Anyways, they were caught and put into jail. But then in 1970, Wright managed to escape from a prison in New Jersey. He was caught and locked up once again, only to escape once more in 1972. This time, he made sure he was never going to be caught again. So he came up with a plan. This plan involved hijacking a Delta Airlines flight and collecting ransom for the release of the passengers. Upon doing so, they flew the plane to Portugal. In 2011, the police caught up with him in Portugal, but since Portugal has no extradition treaty, Treaty with the United States, Wright was released. He remains a fugitive to this day. Coming in at number two, we have Eric Rudolph. In 1996, Eric Rudolph bombed Atlanta's Centennial Olympic Park during the Summer Games. As a result, two individuals were killed and over 100 were injured. But that was just the beginning of his deadly bombing spree. He pulled off three more bombings, injuring hundreds more. For five years, the police were on a hunt for Eric. At one point, he was one of the top 10 fugitives on the FBI's list. It wasn't until 2003 that Eric got arrested. Turns out that he was hiding in the mountains for five years. Being a skilled outdoorsman, this helped him greatly. When he was caught, he pled guilty to all four bombings and was given four life sentences without the possibility of parole. He's now spending the rest of his life in the super prison in Florence, Colorado. And in our number one spot today, we have Santiago Maduros. In 2010, Santiago fired into a random person's car because one of the passengers was wearing the wrong color jacket. The victim had no ties to any gang. He was just an innocent person riding in his sister's car. He was severely injured and his sister was unfortunately killed. A couple weeks later, Santiago and some of his friends were robbing a car. And when a group of men tried to stop them, he shot at them as well. He killed a random person that was just at the wrong place at the wrong time. From there, he was on the run for about a decade. He was finally caught in 2020 in Mexico. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have Kenneth Bianchi. The Hillside Strangler, which was later found out to be a pair of cousins working together, were Kenneth Bianchi and Angelo Buono Jr. The two were charged and convicted for harming and taking the lives of 10 separate women together, with Kenneth taking the lives of two others on his own. After an extremely intensive investigation and the arrest of the two, Kenneth began trying to set up an insanity defense. He claimed disassociative ideas identity disorder. He blamed his alter ego, Steve, for the horrific multitude of crimes. Luckily, however, a court psychologist, Dr. Martin Orne, observed him in his behavior and found that his claims were untrue. After being presented with this finding, Kenneth agreed to plead guilty and testify against his cousin in exchange for leniency on his sentence. He still ended up being sentenced to life in prison, while his cousin got a sentence of life in prison without parole. While Angelo had a heart attack and passed in 2000, and two, Kenneth still remains in prison. In our number nine spot today, we have Warren Jeffs. Warren Jeffs is the president of the Fundamentalist Church of Jesus Christ and the Latter-day Saints, and is also serving a life plus 20 year sentence, which is exactly where he should be. His father was once the president of the, but when he passed, the position was passed on to Warren. As the new leader of the polygamous he said that no one should even attempt to marry one of his father's widows, but just a few days later, he himself married all of them except for two because one refused and then was banned from ever marrying anyone ever again, and the other ran away. If your marriage proposal causes someone to flee the 
cult that they're in, you're clearly not a very good person. Warren had the power to assign who would marry who, but he was also able to punish a man by taking his wives and children and assigning them to another man. As a man, you had to have at least three wives in order to get into heaven, they say, but the more wives, the more likely it would be that you got into heaven. In 2005, the Texas authorities conducted a raid and took legal custody of 416 children after someone called in and tipped them off about all of the horrible things that were happening at the ranch. In 2006, Warren was arrested for being the worst and is still serving his sentence. There is so much more to this case that we don't have time to cover, but there was a documentary released recently called Keep Sweet, Pray and Obey, which I would fully recommend if you want to know more about this horrible person. In our number 8 spot today, we have Tex Watson. Tex Watson was one of the central members of the Manson family, which was led by Charles Manson, and he was a willing participant for the horrible Tate and LaBianca crimes that took place on August 9th and 10th, 1969. If you don't know about them, you can look them up, but just a warning that the events that took place on those nights were horrible, gruesome, and insanely unnecessary. In October of 1969, Tex knew his arrest was coming, so he fled to his home state of Texas, but was later arrested and extradited back to California. Once he was in California, he refused to talk or eat and ended up losing 55 pounds, which got him sent to get tested to see if he was fit to stand trial which he was. In 1971, he was convicted on seven counts related to the killings that happened on those terrible nights. He originally received a death sentence, but it did end up being commuted to life in prison. But get this, you guys, he was able to release a book while in prison, and he got married, and through conjugal visits, he was able to have four children. Thankfully, in 1996, they banned those kinds of visits for people serving life in prison, and in 2003, he did get divorced because his wife had met someone else, which, like, yeah, I would hope so. He also apparently is now a devout Christian, which... It's just interesting. In our number seven spot today, we have the Golden State Killer. If you have any interest in true crime at all, you have most definitely heard of the Golden State Killer, as he was one of the most famous serial killers of all time, and he managed to elude police for 30 years. From 1973 to 1986, the GSK was responsible for taking the lives of 13 people, harming 50, and 120 different burglaries all across California. Throughout the investigation process, he used different tactics to both taunt and and threaten police and victims, which is just on another level of messed up. If you don't know how this story ends, buckle up because it is absolutely wild. So you know those family DNA tests, like those 23andMe things where you send in your DNA and then they send you back your genealogy? Well, basically these services helped identify who the real GSK was. In 2018, when Detective Paul Holes, shout out to MFM if you know you know, and FBI lawyer Steve Kramer uploaded the GSK DNA profile that they were able to obtain from the crime scenes to the website GED Match, they were able to find 10 to 20 people who had the same great, great, great grandparents as the match. From there, a genealogist made a large family tree, and then they were able to single out two main suspects. After covertly connecting DNA samples from one of the suspects and comparing them to the crime scene DNA, they were finally able to arrest Joseph James D'Angelo, who is the Golden State Killer. After decades, of waiting. The victims of his crimes were finally able to see justice served as he was sentenced to 12 life sentences plus 8 years. He was spared the death penalty because he admitted to numerous crimes he had perpetrated, some of which he wasn't even being charged for. He is now 75 years old and he will most certainly spend the rest of his life in prison. In our number 6 spot today we have James Holmes. James is the man behind the 2012 Aurora, Colorado shooting that took the lives of 12 people in injured 70 others in the Century 16 movie theater. Shortly after the crime spree, he was arrested and held without bail while he awaited trial on an accepted plea of not guilty by reason of insanity. I just want to make it clear in this case that insanity doesn't apply to every mental illness, of course. James was and is severely mentally ill, but the court has the job of deciding whether or not that illness made him unable to tell right from wrong. That's what the defense had to prove. Things were admitted to the court, such as his notebooks and journals, as well as testimony from two separate psychologists who spent 22 and 25
five hours with him and both diagnosed him with a serious mental illness but both also stated that in their professional opinion, he knew right from wrong. After a really tumultuous trial, he ended up being found guilty. The jury could have given him a death sentence but on account of his illness, they decided that that would be inappropriate. So in the end, instead, he was sentenced to 12 life sentences without parole and in an additional 3,318 years. In our number 5 spot today, we have Charles Ng. Charles' story really starts off shortly after he moved to the United States on a student visa. He dropped out after his first semester and soon after he was involved in a hit and run accident. He then tried to avoid prosecution by enlisting in the United States Marine Corps using false documents that stated his birthplace was within the United States. He was later arrested by military police a year later for stealing automatic weapons and then somehow he escaped custody, headed back toward Northern California and this is where he met Leonard Lake who is another real piece of work. Charles did end up going away and serving a bit of time but it was only 18 months and he was back with Leonard and that is when the two started their crime spree together. It is believed that together the pair took the lives of somewhere from 11 to 25 different people. When Leonard was caught and brought in for questioning, he sneakily took a cyanide pill he had hidden in his jacket and took his own life but Charles ended up standing trial. He was convicted for 11 of the killings and he remains on death row at San Quentin. In our number 4 spot today we have Paul Bernardo and Carla Homolka. This is a double whammy because unfortunately both of these people are still alive but at least one of them, Paul, is still in jail. This horrible pair are often referred to as the Ken and Barbie killers and while Paul started off living a life of crime, he quickly brought Carla into it as well after their meeting. That is not to say she is not just as guilty as him however because they are both fully responsible for their own actions. While Paul was arrested for a multitude of crimes, the pair were arrested and convicted of taking the lives of three separate people, one of them being Carla's own sister. See what I mean about them both being responsible for their own crimes? They both suck. The investigation into the crimes proved to be quite difficult with authorities having plenty of hoops to jump through and this is why a plea deal was created for Carla. She had one week to accept or decline the deal which would give her a sentence of 12 years for her full cooperation. She accepted. Both were convicted in 2005 and Paul was up to apply for parole in 2018 and in October of that year he was denied. His next parole hearing was just over a year ago on June 22nd of 2021 and it took only an hour of deliberation to decide to turn down that application as well. I personally think 30 seconds probably would have been enough to decide, but I'm just glad the outcome was the same. Carla, on the other hand, served her 12 year sentence and then was released. Like, years ago. She moved away from Canada and headed to Costa Rica for a while with her new husband and children, if you can believe that, but unfortunately, she has since returned. In our number three spot today, we have Edmund Kemper. Edmund Kemper is an American killer who was convicted for taking the lives of 10 people, including his paternal grandparents, as well as his own mother. It is said that he is noted for his height, as he is 6 foot 9 inches, and for his intelligence, as he apparently has an IQ of 145, but I personally think he is most notable for being an absolute monster. His first crime took place when he took the lives of his grandparents, and after this crime, he was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia and spent time in a hospital before it was determined that he was rehabilitated and he was released at the age of 21. After his release, he unfortunately went on a spree where he would target young females who were hitchhiking. After his final crimes, he ended up confessing and turning himself in, which is something we really don't see all of the time. When asked in an interview why he confessed, he said, quote, The original purpose was gone. It wasn't serving any physical or real or emotional purpose. It was just a pure waste of time. Three court-appointed psychiatrists examined and observed him and found him to be legally sane and thus he was able to stand trial. On November 8, 1973, the jury deliberated for just five hours before returning with a verdict of guilty. He has been eligible for parole since 1979 and has been denied every time he applied, one time saying, quote, society is not ready in any shape or form for me. I can't fault them for that. He is eligible to apply for parole again next in 2024. In our number two spot today, we have Stephen Griffiths. This is a person who is said to 
you have idolized the Yorkshire Ripper, so I'm sure what comes next will be no surprise. Stephen was a PhD student who wanted to achieve fame, but through the most sinister way possible. Between June 2009 and May of 2010, he would go on to take the lives of three separate women. His criminal history was also extremely concerning, as years ago, he had been arrested due to an unprovoked attack on a grocery store manager, and it is said that he previously stated that he saw himself becoming a serial killer. Shortly after he was arrested for his crimes, CCTV footage emerged that shows him celebrating after taking the life of his final victim. The footage showed him holding up a crossbow and giving the finger directly to the camera. It is said that Stephen pled guilty to his crimes once caught, not because he was remorseful, but because he wanted to receive the recognition for them. In our number one spot today, we have Joanna Denny. This is a person responsible for a series of killings and attacks that took place in March 2013. Joanna is a very cold and heartless person and has, on many occasions, been said to laugh at her crimes and the lives she took even still behind bars. After the first of her crimes, authorities launched a manhunt for her and they used CCTV footage to help track her down. She was finally caught after attacking two dog walkers who, thanks to immediate medical intervention, were able to survive. There are many things about this story that make it exceptionally chilling and it seems as though most people Joanna encounters are left with quite an impression of what a horrible person she is. On the day she was sentenced, it is reported that the judge, Mr. Justice Spencer, said, Quote, Although you pleaded guilty, you've made it clear you have no remorse. He went on to say, quote, You are a cruel, calculating, selfish, and manipulative serial killer. After this, he sentenced her to a whole life order or life in prison without parole, and it is said that she smiled and laughed at this. Since her time in prison, she is said to have planned escape attempts that involved the killing of a prison guard and other terrifying ideas. Mm -hmm.